year is 2011. I'm in Japan, and I just get delivered to my door, my very own personal robot, <laughs> and I'm excited and fascinated because it's a robot, <laughs> but it looks like a little human, and I imagine it as having human-like capabilities, or maybe something even more. So I upload this video to the internet, to YouTube, and I go about my day as normal. Oh my God, he's so cute. And then now, in 2014, it has something like 125,000 views, which I think is crazy. <laughs> but I think Hello, it's because boy. there are other people out there too one? who believe in the excitement like and the possibilities the of robots. Body. These are the robots that we've seen in the movies. When we're in trouble, they help us out, but they're also really nice. They're kind, they're funny. When we're happy, they're happy with us. And when we're sad, they're sad with us, even for just a little while, just like any good friend would be. So, fast forward to June of this year, I'm in Tokyo and I see with my very own eyes another birth of a robot. This time it's called Pepper. And I hear the vision of the future 30 years from now, 100 years from now, where robots are the next generation of technology after the PC and the mobile phone. Instead of writing apps for a phone, we would program skills into a robot. Just like our computer and phone's data is stored in the cloud, we would be able to download our robot's skills into any robot anywhere in the world. So this is where people start to get a little scared. <laughs> and they say, is this where robots take over the world? You know, where AI enslaves us and becomes our overlords. Well, a lot of researchers don't like to talk about this. So I'm going to talk about it. Because more and more companies out there are investing in robotics. Google last year bought eight different companies, including the one that makes this robot named Atlas. They spent $630 million investing in an artificial intelligence company in the UK. And they're not alone. Amazon.com is investing heavily in their fleet of robot drones. So the question is, is this fear irrational? Why do we fear this future of robot overlords? Is it just because we've all seen these scary movies like The Terminator? or is it because there's something more to it? So, to understand this phenomenon a little bit more, I'd like to give you an example scenario. This is Linda. Linda has just flown across the country, driven 50 kilometers from the airport through the pouring rain, when she finally arrives, soaked with the rain. But she's relieved because she's finally made it to the hospital where her mother, Helen, has been admitted. And this time it sounds serious. Linda sees her mother, Helen, through the hospital room window, and all she wants to do is tell her how sorry she is for not being there the last few years. All she wants to do is hold her mother's hand and tell her that she's there now that everything's gonna be okay. Well, at this particular hospital, there's a robot that takes care of the facility, and it's set to lock the doors at 9 p.m. It's now 9.01 p.m., and the robot says, no visitors are allowed. And Linda, she pleads with the robot, please let me see my mom. What if this is the last chance we ever get to spend together where she's alive? Please open the door. But to a robot, the rules are rules. 
In the words of Dale Carnegie, people are not creatures of logic, they're creatures of emotion. Yet robots are built on binary logic. They unfailingly do what they were programmed to do, what they believe is right, without any exceptions. So, why are we afraid of a robot overlord future? Maybe it's because we've seen this before. History's worst dictators also believed that what they were doing was right, what was best for humanity, or they were programmed to believe it. And so, this cruel combination of brilliance, calculating logic, and lack of compassion is what truly we fear. So today I'd like to propose an idea, an idea that might set us on the path not towards that scary overlord future, but one where robots and the technology of the future is kind and compassionate. And that idea is one word. It starts with an E, and that's empathy. Let me explain. You see, in the world, there are two kinds of empathy. Cognitive empathy and affective empathy. Cognitive empathy is rational. We put ourselves into the shoes of another person and we try to logically calculate how we must feel in their situation. If you've ever had something like this on your Facebook feed, today I received some terrible news and you just kept on scrolling. <laughs> it's because cognitive empathy doesn't work all the time. On the other hand, there's affective empathy. Affective empathy is based on a mechanism called emotional contagion, which is automatic, unconscious. We see someone that's down and we mirror their faces as they drop, their voices as they get lower, and we share their pain. Indeed, affective empathy is something that I think is important to believe, to build in our robots of the future so that they're not cold, calculating machines where logic trumps the feelings we have as humans, but they're kind, compassionate. They have affective empathy. So why did I tell you about cognitive empathy and affective empathy? Well, interestingly enough, the people in the world that do not have affective empathy, we diagnose as psychopaths. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is really why I believe that this is a crucial component to think about and to build in technology of the future. This is Monica. Monica is a writer from New York, and when she visited my lab at Kyoto University about eight months ago, I don't think she knew that she would be such a critical piece to the development of this idea of robot empathy. So we'll get back to her in a moment. Because some people still ask me, Angelica, even if a robot looks like it has emotions and empathy, is it real? Isn't that just like a fake kind of emotion it was programmed to show? Let's talk about authenticity. According to Miriam Webster, there are at least two things you need for something to be authentic. The first is that it should have the same essential features as the original. For example, if you have a castle, it should have the same spires, the same archways as the original 18th century castle. But secondly, and almost more importantly, it should be made in the same way as the original. So for empathy, we need to look at humans, at infants, at us as parents to understand how empathy is built in us. And the answer is fascinating. 
We know the components of empathy in our brain. There's the mirror system where we are able to mirror other people in ourselves. There's the insular cortex where we store the associations between these body images and our internal gut feelings. And the somatosensory cortex where we store the feeling of goodness or badness as we feel it in our mind and our body. So we modeled these three brain areas in a robot at Kyoto University, and then we went on to development. How do we develop empathy as infants? Have you ever seen this kind of situation before? Yeah, when a parent goes 30 centimeters from their child's face, they give it a big smile and they say, who's a good girl? Oh, yes you are. <laughs> This is called mother ease, and it's found in every culture of the world. Some developmental psychologists believe that it is an essential piece to the building of emotion and cognition. And so, with this developmental process between caregivers and infants, we replaced the infant May with a robot. May. May. And this is what it looked like. May. May. The robot may expresses may. its distress. May may. Low may battery. May. May may. Low energy. May may. May may. And the may caregiver may. comforts it. May may. And the robot makes this association with the sound may of voice and face to its may physical may. feeling. May may. May may. May may. Now the caregiver may is playing may with may the robot. May. And the robot may associates may. this happy may face may. and happy voice may may. with its may all may. systems go Full may energy, may may good and happy, may may physical may feeling. May 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 and they synchronize. May may and so, this I believe is the beginning of a new kind of robot, one that has the same kind of empathetic circuits that our brain has, that has experienced the same kind of caregiver love and empathy, so that one day too it will know how to love and how to have empathy. It will know, it will not just know the difference between right or wrong, it will feel to its very physical core when something is right or when something's wrong. So if we go back to the question, are robots gonna take over the world? My message to all of you is one of hope. Because yes, we can and will make laws and regulations, but there's an even more powerful force in this world. Emotion, empathy, the building blocks of morality. And I see an open future with moral machines and moral people. Thank you very much. Dr. Angelica, before you go, there's a few questions I want to ask you. Uh, you talk about robots and feeling love and stuff like that. And yeah. we've all seen the robot movies, right? What if they don't feel love? Mm. What if they never experience love so that they could feel love? Well, th it's a good question because we have to say, what happens to us as humans if we've never felt love or experienced love as an infant? And I can tell you, Calvin, that we have evidence, it's a kind of a terrible experiment to run, right? We're just gonna have an, a baby and see what happens if it's never field love. But it, after the World War, there were actually an instance in Eastern Europe where thousands of babies were put into orphanages where they had food and shelter but did not experience caregiver love. And these people turned out to be adults that unfortunately could not recognize happiness, could, ro could not recognize sadness, but could recognize anger. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Wow, all right, so is uh, Naoki here today? Yes, well, I'm very pleased to tell you that as we, let's walk over here. And in fact, Naoki has the pleasure of down, being downloaded into a body signed by your former prime minister. So um, here is Naoki, and let's see.
say hi to everyone. Wow. Hello, Kuala Lumpur. I'm very happy to meet you. Can you do a dance for them? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Angelica.